sorts of resources to put the information in a book that has not been printed out there, or you would have to go to five different books to find it and just put it all in one. And I started to talk before about how when I started Planet Ed Marie, uh, I did not know much about her. She went to prison, and then there was nothing else. And I figured, well, she just started marrying guards left and right and changed her name <laughs> a thousand times. Who can keep track of this woman? But then in 2007, I got a letter in the mail at the Water Factory case addressed to me, and, um, and it was from a woman named Karen Sickert in Oklahoma. And she said, hey, hi, Cynthia. Uh, I understand you make a living pretending to be my grandmother. I'm like, wow, okay. And by the way, she is watching in Oklahoma today, so hi, granddaughter, nice to see you. So uh, she came up here, she took the tour. Uh, I learned so much from her, and then she wrote a book about her grandmother and about the farm, and she if you kindly uh, let us take information from her book, so that was great. And so we got a lot of information about both Volney Davis, who was Edna's sweetheart, from Karen Sickert, uh, and also Barker Gang member's granddaughter. And then when it came to Alvin Karpus, uh, we really wanted to get into his psychology and what made this guy tick. And luckily for us, he wrote his autobiography, Public Enemy, the Alvin Karpus Story. It is out of print, but if you want another really good book to, to uh, go and look at, uh, you can find it in libraries and online. It's super expensive online. Because you they can buy it online, but they don't accept it's really expensive. it because it's out of print. But um, <laughs> if you want an original anyway. Yeah, but that's but okay. anyway, we had it. So we had uh, stuff in his head. But knowing gangsters like we do, after hearing these stories, we know these guys are just terrible liars. You know, and, and Alvin Karpus has made himself out to be this great guy. And then in 2010, 2011, my husband and I were working on a documentary film about gangsters called Gangsterland. Alvin Karpus was the main character. And we ended up hooking up with a gentleman in Canada whose name is Robert Lidgeway. And he helped Alvin Karpus write his second book about his life in Alcatraz. Alvin Karpus set the record for staying in Alcatraz longer than anybody. And so uh, he had this resource. He had spent years interviewing Alvin Karpus. He had reams of notes. He went to, you know, after Karpus got out of Alcatraz, he went to go meet with him in Spain. And so I was able to send uh, my chapter on Alvin Karpus to Robert Lidgeway, who came back and said, yep, here's where he's lying. <laughs> here's where he's telling the truth. Here's where I think this and here's that. So, uh, and he gave us some tidbits that, again, have not been published anywhere else but are in our book. So, um, and it was a long, arduous process. And we were ready to turn the book in when I reconnected with Robert. So he had to contact our publisher and go, hey, it's not going to get in for another couple months. Is that okay? <laughs> so that was that. So I think we'd like to talk just a little bit more about the actual meat of the book. Right, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab my book. Uh, the, the actual... The story that, that we talk about the gangsters, one of the things that people always want to know is why Minnesota, why here? And there's a cha whole chapter in the book on why Minnesota. And there's a lot of answers to that. But probably the biggest answer is, is involves the police chief, John Gerald Connolly. And I, I wanted to read a, a little bit from the book that I, I wrote about Chief O'Connolly because I think it's really interesting. So a lot of people tend to think of that he was a bad guy because he, he let people come to St. Paul you know, to be safe here, let so many come to St. Paul and they could be safe here. But really he was a good cop. He was just trying to do his best to make, uh, make, make the crime out of St. Paul and uh, with a very limited budget. And so he came up with this system. And it's referred to by his name. It's called the O'Connell Layover System, but he never called it that. But um, so I want to I wanna just read a little bit of the book about Chief O'Connell. Chief O'Connor had an idea to keep St. Paul safe. He called it opposing organized crime with organized intelligence. It would come to, to, come to be known as the O'Connor layover system, even though O'Connor himself never used that phrase. He allowed criminals to stay in St. Paul, but they committed no crimes within the city, and he personally made sure they adhered to his rules. If they behaved themselves, I let them alone, he said. But if they stepped out of line, they might find themselves locked in a room with the chief himself from which they might emerge in far worse shape than when they entered. He and his officers were aware of every criminal who entered their city. 
Many siblings appreciated and enjoyed the Haven of St. Paul, so they often helped with enforcement themselves. No one wanted another kid to disrupt their system. Now, O'Connor served a couple of different terms as chief. The last, he finally retired in 1920. He died just a few years after that. But the system remains and continues to go on, coming to its fullest fruition under police chief Tom Brown. And I think I have my slide up. Well, another thing that really enabled the crime to bloom in Minnesota was not just because the gang chief was also here, uh, Chief O'Connor, um, was that uh, prohibition came into effect. It was passed in 1919. It was also known as the Volstead Act after Minnesota Congressman Andrew J. Volstead, who had his office right here in this building. So when you go upstairs to look at courtroom 317 where Alvin Parker had his trial, uh, just around the corner down the hall is the office of Andrew Volstead, who wrote the 18th Amendment. So yeah, prohibition, born right here in St. Paul. We're pretty proud, yeah, I know. Uh, but Minnesota was just the perfect storm for enabling bootlegging for around the country. And it provided a lot of the booze for other states. We had Rockwell's Water just here to land at 10,000 Lakes. Uh, we had lots of grain, fermentable grain, grown in southern Minnesota. We had lots of Germans with nothing to do. So we had a lot of Germans who knew how to make beer. Uh, we had the Mississippi River for transporting. We had the railroad system of um, James J. Hill. Uh, who founded the Great Northern Railroad, and so we had more railroad ties, and we had a convenient border with Canada where there was no prohibition. And so we had a lot of people making alcohol here, and the gangs came here, and the products that they could buy and sell and manufacture and export, and it became quite the cottage industry in Minnesota, again, thanks to uh, Mr. Volstead. In fact, there is a story in the book that you will not find anywhere else, and it's a story about a, a farmer who was farming in northern Crystal, Minnesota, who used to go up to Canada every week during the 1930s, 1920s, sorry, 1920s, to buy hay. Why is a Minnesota farmer going up to Canada to buy hay? Because he was filling the haystacks with alcohol and bringing it back. And the reason you will only find that story in our book is because his name was Art Peterson, who was my great uncle. It's kind of my theory after doing those gangster tours for 22 years, we went to these people say, my grandpa, my uncle, my this. I kind of, uh, I used to joke that you shake any family tree in Minnesota and a bootleg or two will fall out. <laughs> and uh, in fact, just yesterday, I was talking with one of my cousins who's um, about 20 years older than me. And I heard a story for the very first time that I'd never heard before about my grandpa who died before I was born, he goes, oh yeah, Grandpa dug a cave in the backyard for his moonshine and he covered it up with hay, or no, uh, corn stalks. And then the cows came along and ate the corn stalks and that's how they found his booze and he went to prison Christmas Eve. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> we should have known that. Maybe would have put it in the book. Yeah. <laughs> but the meat of our book is uh, obviously uh, the Barker and family and Alvin Parker. So I just want to give you a little overview of the Barker family. We, we, we mentioned that most historians today do not believe Ma Barker was even a criminal. Um, certainly she knew what the boys were doing. Um, certainly she benefited from it. She liked her fur coats and her creature comforts. But she was probably not the criminal mastermind that she was portrayed as by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI after her death. In fact, before her death, she was never mentioned in any FBI report by name. At one point, they, they, they did say, well, the gang is traveling with an with a older woman who is believed to be one of their mothers. But that's all until after her death. And in fact, the book covers a little bit about why she may have been portrayed as a criminal uh, in later years. It's sort of one of those examples of history is often written by the wind. Uh, but anyway, Ma Barker had four sons, Herman, Lloyd, Arthur, who later became known as Doc, and her favorite son, Freddie. All four of her boys came to crime. So she may not have been a good mother, but at least she was consistent, right? <laughs> now, uh, the, um, she was married to a man uh, who was, had, was born Arizona, Donnie Clark. Her first name was Arizona, not Kate. She just liked the name Kate. So if you ever heard, heard her referred to as Kate Ma Barker, that's not really her name. But uh, so she, um, she married a man by the, by the name of George Barker. Uh, they, were in, they were in Missouri, but eventually, the boys were all born in Missouri, but eventually they moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And eventually, George moved back to Missouri, leaving her with the boys. And all four of the boys got into more, more and more and more serious trouble. Her oldest son, Herman, was actually killed in a shootout. 
uh, with the police. Uh, he was already wounded, possibly mortally wounded, did not want to be captured, took his own life. Her second son, Lloyd, actually was arrested and imprisoned and was never part of the Barker gang as we talk about it because he wasn't paroled until the 1940s. So would he have been a member of the Barker gang had he gotten out of prison? We don't know. But the two members, the two sons who were the nucleus of the Barker gang were his son Arthur, who later became known as Doc, and her youngest son, Freddie. And they were the ones who formed the, the nucleus of the Barker gang along with Elvin Carpet, who was actually probably more important than anybody, even Freddie Barker. So Elvin Carpus, when you decided to write this book, I felt that you begged Deb, let me write that chapter. <laughs> she I didn't just have to beg very hard. <laughs> no, no. We knew it would be the longest or the most difficult, but, but the whole, I'm not, I shouldn't put it that way. It was going to be the longest. We knew that because we decided to outline most of the crimes within his chapter because he really was the mastermind. He's the one who planned them. Uh, Alvin Karpus was brilliant. He, he had a very high IQ. He was very, very smart. Uh, ironically, when he went to Alcatraz, the psychological tests um, said that he was not criminally inclined. That they could just couldn't figure out why this well-spoken, intelligent man had committed all of these bank robberies and kidnappings and most likely several murders. Uh, so he was just an interesting, fascinating psychological study. Um, and so Alvin Karpus uh, decided at the age of 10 that he wanted to be a gangster, that he wanted to be a criminal. Um, and then off he went. Uh, by the time he was 17, he went into prison for the first time, and he met a crazy guy, and I do mean crazy, named Larry Duvall. Um, Larry Duvall was most likely psychotic on several levels, and they went off on a life of crime together when they both got out of prison. And we talk a lot about Larry in the book within the Carpus chapter. Uh, afterwards, I almost wish we'd given him his own chapter <laughs> because the more I got into it, the more I really became fascinated with this guy. Um, and then they get thrown in prison again, and uh, Carpus now ends up with uh, in prison with uh, Fred Barker, Ma's baby. And they hit it off like that. And Fred had a lot of pull in the prison, so he got Carpus pulled in as his uh, cellmate. And they vowed that when they got out of prison, they would go into business together. And Alvin Carpus uh, considered Fred the best friend he ever had. Uh, and he was proud of the fact that their names would be linked together forever. Back then, it was known as the Carpus Barker Gang. And uh, he insisted on his name first, but eventually through history, it just became the Barker Gang, mostly because of these um, fallacies that Deborah was talking about, about Ma Barker being the brains of it, and she wasn't. It was Alvin Carpus and also Fred. They, they were the smart ones. Doc, he was along for the ride. He really wasn't that bright. <laughs> but very nasty, though. Very nasty. Not too bright, but very, very bad guy. Not so good with a gun. I mean, very good with a gun. Um, we, we quoted from Alvin Karpus's book, and just to give you a little slice of into his mind, uh, I'll read you one of the quotes that we lifted from his book and put into ours. Um, and he wrote it in 1971, and he had a photographic memory. That was the other thing about Alvin Karpus. He remembered every detail of every shot. So that's why it's really hilarious when he starts claiming he can't remember if he killed anybody or not. But there you go. He says, my profession was robbing banks, knocking off payrolls, and kidnapping rich men. I was good at it. Maybe the best in North America for five years from 1931 to 1936. My work became a profession because that's how I approached it. In another set of circumstances, I might have made it to any high position that demanded brains and style and a cool, hard way of handling yourself. And I was a pro. So you can see that Alvin Karpus also did not suffer from <laughs> lack of self-esteem either. <laughs> but uh, he and uh, Freddie and another guy named Will Weaver um, did a robbery down in Missouri and um, ended up that a sheriff got shot and killed. So uh, he claims he didn't, but, you know, we don't know who for sure killed the sheriff, who shot the sheriff, but it was Karpus or uh, Fred Barker. Uh, Robert Ridley believes it was Karpus but we'll never know. But anyway, they had to get out of there, and they had to go someplace safe to hide. And so there was a, a Barker family friend, Herb Farmer, who said, you got to go up to St. Paul, Minnesota, because there's a deal there. 
and uh, where the fix is in with the cops, and it's going to be a great place to go. So Alvin Karpus came up here, and uh, he went straight to see a guy named Harry Sawyer at the Green Lantern, and Deb wrote about Harry Sawyer, so maybe you could come down here. Uh, Harry Sawyer at the, the Green Lantern actually was originally owned by a fellow by the name of Dapper Danny Hogan, who was known as the Irish Godfather of St. Paul. Now, Dapper Danny Hogan actually died in one of the very first confirmed car bombings in the United States. He actually died in 1929 when he went out to his own car. Now, this, this official death um, is officially unsolved to this day, but a lot of people believe that Harry Sawyer might have done it so he could take over operations at the Green Lantern Saloon. And this was a place where a criminal would come to check in, uh, a criminal could leave their money in the safe at the Green Lantern, and this was a very, uh, very important place for the criminal. Obviously, when you came to check in, you did not go marching up the steps of the police station and say, hi, I'm John Dillinger, I'm here for a couple of weeks. You didn't do that. You actually checked in with uh, one of the liaisons, and Harry Sawyer was one of those. Yes. <laughs> did you see that? I got a sign. Uh, <laughs> We're doing fine. We're okay. Doing fine. Just uh, so anyway, yes, Alvin Karpus went to the Green Lantern to a New Year's Eve party. It was December 31st of 1931, and uh, he was in heaven. He said it was a rogues gallery, or, you know, because there was uh, people of any kind of criminal ilk were there. He said he only drank coffee because he wanted to stay sober. And uh, he made more connections that night than he had his entire criminal career. And later he referred to the Green Lantern as my personal headquarters in St. Paul. And they did uh, meet there a lot. Um, they moved into a house in uh, West St. Paul on Robert Street. And from there, the Carpus Barker gang started robbing banks uh, all over the Midwest. And what's really interesting is Alvin Carpus was so smart um, that they flew under the radar. I mean, certainly law enforcement knew the names Alvin Carpus and Fred Barker because of the murder of the sheriff down in Missouri. They were wanted for that, but they had no idea that there was an organized gang called the Carpus Barker Gang. And many of the crimes that this gang committed, um, they attributed to other gangs. Oh, it's the Tui Gang. Oh, it's this gang. It's that gang. Must have been Dillinger, whatever. Uh, and Carpus liked it that way. He didn't want to have the flashy notoriety that John Dillinger did because he thought that would make his job harder. And it wasn't discovered until 1934, the middle of 1934, that there was actually a Carpus Barker gang, and we describe that in the book, how it came to be that the FBI finally figured out that this most successful gang, arguably, in the 1930s, was actually out there doing all these other crimes, and the FBI had absolutely no uh, idea about it. And most historians pretty much agree that Alvin Carpus was probably a lot smarter than the FBI, and a lot smarter than J. Edgar Hoover, <laughs> and uh, that's why he was able to get away with that. So, okay. I think that's it, girl. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'll just do a real quick thing. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's still you. It's Edna It's Bowling. still us. Yeah, we, we got time. We got time. Uh, it's still me. So, um, <clears throat> we also, I mentioned that we did this kind of like a bathroom reader. We're doing it in uh, uh, chapters. And so we made the decision that several of the crimes are described in each different character's chapter, but from their point of view. Uh, so... Edna Murray gives her take on the Bremer kidnapping. Volney Davis has his take on it. And then we have Alvin Karpus's take on it. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of fun. You can read back and it's the, like, you know, it's the same story, but now from a different point of view. Uh, and so we go through that. Volney Davis uh, was a, a big member of the gang. Uh, he had his trial here also for the kidnapping of Edward Bremer, uh, along with uh, Byron Bolton and, and a whole bunch of other Barker gang members, Edna Murray. Uh, was here as a witness. Charges were dropped against her for some whatever reason. We don't know why. Because she was so beautiful. Because she was so pretty like me, yeah. <laughs> I know. So we give each of them a chapter. Uh, and we feel that they were underserved gang members. I mean, when you read about them, you realize they were just as bad as any of the Barker brothers, and they did bug just as much. Uh, but they deserve their own thing. And I just want to touch real quickly on one of the things when we were writing the book is they wanted a lot of pictures. I think they wanted a minimum of 40 pictures. And um, it, it was kind of difficult finding pictures because historical societies want you to pay a lot of money per photo, and we're like, we're just struggling actors here. We can't do that. So um, Pam Tippett, Edna's granddaughter, uh, gave us a lot of photos from her collection, which was great. We thank you so much, Pam. 
Uh, and then the St. Paul Police Historical Society, they helped us with research and they gave us a lot of photos, which was wonderful. We met these three great old retired St. Paul police officers uh, over at the headquarters and they let us interview them and let us take pictures of their pictures and that was great. But it came down to the end, we had actually turned the book in and we had no decent picture of Volney Davis and he had his own chapter and it drove me crazy. I had photos of him, but they weren't up to the publisher's standards. And I went, this wily guy. And it wasn't until, I think a month after we had turned the book in, I was finally able to wrangle a photo of him from Alcatraz, where he went. So when you get the book, please admire the photo of Volney Davis. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears shed over that, but he's a pretty good looking guy, actually. There's, there is also another photo in the book that you need to admire. And that is a photo that we got from the St. Paul Police Department Historical Society. And it has not been published anywhere yes. until our book. Uh, and it is a picture of the interior of the Green Lantern Saloon, Henry Sawyer's Green Lantern Saloon. It's actually a picture of the interior. Um, the St. Paul Policeman's Historical Society had it for a while, but we're uh, only able to confirm recently that that's what it actually is. So it's never been published anywhere. You won't find it in any other book about the subject. So. It's, it's one, one another photo you want to make sure you admire. So this is wrapping up um, what we were going to talk about, and we're right on time, 30 minutes, thank you. Uh, but we want to have the opportunity for you to ask questions uh, after the Q&A, if you have any questions. Um, then, yes, you can go up and look at the courtroom, uh, 317. You can look at um, Andrew Volstead's office. Um, there's also a detention room where Alvin Karpus was chained to a radiator for three days in this building while the FBI came in and uh, took turns grilling him, beating him up a little bit. He was arrested uh, down in New Orleans and flown up here, and he's still wearing the clothes he was wearing when they arrested him for three solid days. Um, and they would only unhook him to let him go to the bathroom once in a while, but only at night when there were no people here. So you had to hold it all day long. So if you wish, down also in the lower level by those other restrooms, uh, that Jenny told you about is a, a, a little museum and um, it has a lot of the history of this building but also there's a, a couple sections dedicated to the gangsters and they moved down there the actual radiator that Alvin Karpus was chained to for those three days and just for fun they put a set of handcuffs on it <laughs> so you'll know which one it is uh, so we're gonna go and do the um, book signings and you know because COVID and all that as much as I would love to just it's been weird she was in France and we wrote, and then since she's been back here, we can't hug and go, we did it. We just have to go, hi. We do Facebook conversations a lot. I know. One, one, I just want to say one more thing be, before we open it up for the, for the question and answer and, um, and before we, we talk about that. I, I just wanted to add one thing. That these guys, we don't want to make it sound like we glorified these guys. We do not glorify these guys. We find them interesting from a psychological point of view but I think we make it very clear that these were bad, bad men, and they did horrible, vicious things. Mary Pavlak, did you make it today? Are you here? Mary, this is Mary Pavlak over here, guys. Doc Barker murdered her grandfather on the steps of the South St. Paul Post Office in cold blood. We talk about that in the book. So Mary, thank you so much for coming today. I'm very excited to meet you. Yes, that is, ex it's, it's outlined in the Alvin Karpus section. We have a photograph that the St. Paul police gave us of, there it is, of the South St. Paul post office where Mary's grandfather was murdered along with um, John Yeaman, another South St. Paul police officers. And uh, from what I understand to this day, the only South St. Paul police officers ever to be killed in the line of duty. Jo John Yeaman survived. Oh, that's right. You yeah. knew that. Oh, that's right. John Yeaman survived. He, he was, was severely wounded. He had 25 pieces of, of lead in that's him. That's right. Including one, but one that lodged behind his right eye, but he did survive and went back to work on the South St. Paul Post Office. St. Paul, South St. Paul Police Department. Sorry. Yeah. So that's one of the stories you'll get. So I might have to get you to sign my book. <laughs> to have a Pavlak <laughs> here signing the book would be actually awesome. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, and then after... Uh, all the signing is done, whatever time that will be. Uh, I suppose we should pick a time so everybody can come back. Um, if you are interested, we'll do a, a quick, like, 30-minute walking tour around this area and give you a few stories. A couple of them probably aren't even in the book. 
uh, about gangsters in this area uh, if you're interested. So, and that's again, no charge, just because we can't stop talking, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. so does anybody have any questions at this time? Five forty five Wabasha Street. Um, if you go the, to that address now, it's a big it says five forty five in huge numbers. It's actually it's a, an apartment building now, but that's where it used to stand. Now people did not enter through the front door at five forty five Wabasha. You had to know what you were doing and go, you went in the back door. But that's where the Green Lantern stood. You know, I've taken the I've taken the gangster tour in Chicago and I have to say it was really disappointing because there's almost nothing left in Chicago, they point something out and say, well, that's where the garage used to be, where the St. John's Eyes and Massacre was. One of the things about St. Paul, and you'll find in our book, you'll find a lot of pictures. A lot of the things are still here. There's still a house where the Barker gang lived when they first came here. The South St. Paul Post Office, obviously, is still here. Um, there's all kinds of things. The, the place where Dillinger shot it out with the feds. All of these are still here. And so that's one thing that makes St. Paul a little more fun gangster history than Chicago because the places are still here. And just to be clear, that's 545 North Wabasha, I'm not sorry. South Wabasha. No, that's okay, because I do Can that I too. So? I just forget, it's downtown. It's kind of kitty corner from the History Center. So it's actually not that far from here. And right down the block is Candyland. You can get some popcorn. <sighs> Anyone else have a question? Yes. You know, no one knows. And in fact, in some places you don't. It, in some places, I've even seen it spelled D O C K, like not short for doctor, but like Doc on the bay. And no one seems to know how he got the nickname. Um, and because it isn't, it isn't like he was any kind of a doctor, believe me. Um, but that's what he was called. Yeah, exactly. I just we just don't. No, no one seems to know that. Well, I'm going to keep researching. I'm going to find that out. We'll find out. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, um, there's several stories as to why Carpus was called creepy. Um, one of the stories that we always heard doing the gangster tours was that if you, um, if you made him mad, he would just stare and stare at you until you got the creeps, because he was creepy. But when I was talking to Robert Livesay, who interviewed Carpus, Robert said, no, that's, that's a urban legend, that's not what it was. Uh, Carpus told him it was because he was really good at uh, car chases, and he would drive really well and evade the police. And his ability, the police, there was one police officer who one time said that Carpus's ability to evade them in a car chase was downright creepy. And so that's what Carpus said. Now, Which can we believe? Can that? we believe him? It's like over in Minneapolis, uh, the guy over there that ran the mob was Kid Can Blumenfeld. And he always told everybody his nickname was Kid Can because he was good at fighting and he would knock you on your can. And then we met somebody who grew up with him and said, no, when the shooting started in the Gateway District, young Isidore Blumenfeld would run and hide in the bathroom behind the toilet. So we started calling him Kid Can. You know, so uh, which story is right, you know? So it's the same with creepy Carpus. Is it because he was good at driving and evading people, or is it was because he was just a stinking creep? He know? wasn't creepy looking. He was actually quite a handsome man. He wasn't man. bad looking. We yeah, got a couple pictures but, uh, of him in here, yeah. And I think the lady in the back there had a question. There, there, was a, there was a nightclub called the Green Lantern out on Rice Street, but it was not connected with the Green Lantern owned by Harry Sawyer. There were several places called the Green Lantern. There was one up on the west side, two near Annapolis and Smith Street. One in Minneapolis. It, one in Minneapolis. A Green Lantern, and we actually, when we were there uh, at the police department, the police showed us a Green Lantern, which was used a lot for signaling during that, area, that era. So oftentimes, speakeasies had Green Lanterns. Well, I don't know if it was the original one, but the one that was used by the gangsters and was run by Harry Sawyer, the crime boss, was at 545 Wabasha. Yes. 
you know, I, de I definitely believe she wasn't. Um, uh, There, there, there is actually no proof that Ma was even firing back. Here's the thing that Alvin Karp really? used to say on that very uh, subject. He would say, look, uh, the FBI published a photo of Ma Barker's dead body with a smoking Tommy gun at her side. The FBI admits that they did not enter that building until a full 45 minutes after the shooting stopped. Would that gun still be smoking after 45 minutes? Somebody probably picked it up, fired it, laid it next to her body, took the picture as extra proof. Oops, we just killed this old lady. That's a bad PR yeah. move. Better I make it look like she was shooting back the, at us. Uh, when, the, uh, when the shootout was finished, the FBI actually, big brave G-men, actually sent uh, Ma's gardener in to check on the house. Now, in their defense, they figured they knew him and he, they wouldn't hurt him. And, and he said he was appalled and he, he cried and everything. Um, but he, his opinion was, you shot this old lady. He said there was no gun anywhere near her. In fact, when he found them, he, she was holding Freddie in her lap and trying to staunch his wounds. Exactly. Alvin Carpus said the same thing. I don't believe she was. Alvin Karpus also writes in his autobiographer about how they planned a lot of their jobs driving around in cars uh, so that Ma wouldn't hear. She knew they were gangsters, she knew what they did, uh, but he, they just wanted to protect her from the details. Her, her crime was harboring a fugitive because she knew what the boys were doing and didn't turn them in, but yeah. that would be her only crime, harboring a fugitive. Yeah. She loved them. <laughs> she didn't like the women too much. No, she didn't. But, you know, these people had, this is why I, I enjoyed doing the psychological part of this. Um, Edna Murray used to tell her granddaughter that she was a good girl. She was just misunderstood. I went to the, uh, a gangster museum in Chicago, and they had a mannequin there, a Ma Barker holding a Tommy gun, and I went to people that ran the museum, and I'm like, yeah, that, that's not true. And they just said, nope, but that's what people want to see. So it's just, you know, something gets repeated, and it's a great story. It makes a better story, so you repeat it, and you repeat it, and then people think it's true. It, it's just like with Alvin Karpus. Uh, the story is out there that he killed himself, and I don't believe for a second that he killed himself. And I outline in the book exactly why. I don't believe Alvin Karpus committed suicide. It just was not within his nature. Anybody else with a question? Yeah, yes, ma'am. question. Oh, Clifford, you mean, yeah. Yes, it's Nina. Uh, I know a whole lot about her because I play her on the gangster tour. And it is Nina. Um, I, mean, I talked to the Historical Society, and he said because she was of Irish descent, she would have been pronouncing her name Nina. Nina's Coffee Shop is named after her. Um, I don't want to get into too much, although you and I can talk later if you want. Actually, but I just if you take the tour that we're walking, Nina's on the tour. Exactly. So you so, can take the walking tour, but, but you can do she, a little quickie. She was definitely, she, she was, like I said, the, the high-class madam in St. Paul from 1888 until 1929. So she definitely was, was through this era. Now, she would have been deceased by the time the Barker gang got here, the Carpus Barker gang got here. But certainly the bootleggers and everything else would have been her patrons. Shall we go sign books? I think so. All right. Okay, if that's all the questions. And you have opportunities to ask questions, uh, not a lot, while we're signing. Um, and I hope we see every single one of you coming through the line. That would be fabulous. Uh, and uh, Christmas, holidays, Hanukkah, whatever, coming up soon. They make great gifts. So please consider that. Uh, also for sale, um, we have a couple other options if you wish. I mentioned to you the, um, the Gangsterland documentary style movie that we did in 2011. We have some copies of those for sale if you wish. Uh, they normally go for $20 plus tax. Uh, but here today at the Landmark, because you all came out here, it's going to be $15 tax included. 
And then uh, Deborah told you that she has written several books about ghosts. We have copies of her Haunted Ybor City. Halloween's coming up. Uh, and those also are normally 20 plus tax, but because you're here today, it'll be $15 tax included. So uh, plenty of opportunities to buy gifts for yourself or others while you're here today. And we are at, um, t we have separate tables, all of this to try to keep all you great people safe. If you are going to write cash or give cash or write a check, you can see Kathy straight back there. She's waving, yay. And just beyond her is a table with Craig. He's kind of hidden behind the plants right now. The guy in the bowler but, uh, hat. He's set up to do credit cards. And all three items are at both um, tables it's for you to purchase. And then um, we are going to be separated again. Uh, so I am going to be at the front table there where you signed in when you came in today. And Deborah is going to be over there so you can have one sign and have the other sign. And you know what? You don't have to have anybody sign if you don't want to. I know some people prefer not to have a book signed, and that's OK. Um, so you can talk to both of us for briefly and have both of us sign it. And if you can give us just like a minute to go back and grab our pens and get settled uh, by the time you've got your book, hopefully we'll be over at our tables. And thank you one last time for coming down here today. We thank really you very appreciate much. it. Thank you. Thank you.